My name is uh, David Jones, and I'm not quite sure what my official title is, but even Rita wasn't like programs or something like that. But anyways, our speaker today, I think everybody knows, I had the privilege of meeting Sam uh, during the training session for the class of 2019. As it says up there, uh, Sam is a urban wildlife biologist and he takes care primarily of the Eastern Metroplex. Um, he has a wealth of experience in a variety of areas involving nature. He's also served as an instructor at Weatherford uh, College. He earned a master's degree from uh, Tarleton State University where he studied genetics in pocket gophers. And um, Useful, useful information. Yeah, Use it every day. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Further ado, Mr. Good. Sam. Thank you so much. Gosh, it is good to see you all here today. Can I get, um, and you can brag if you raise your hands. Anybody get rain last night? Okay, right here. Me too. We can, we can brag. We can brag. Um, I was able to get some rain. I knocked down a couple big uh, brittle branches that were dry from all summer, but worth it. Worth it for a little roof damage. I'll take uh, an inch or two. Um, so yes, thank you so much, David, for that introduction. We're going to talk about wasps. Let's talk about wasps. We'll start out with story time. A show of hands. How many of you have ever been stung by a wasp? Anyone? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, good. Um, anybody have any interesting experiences with being stung by a wasp? Would you mind? And I actually intentionally got stung by a wasp because I was putting my child's son or my friend's son into my car to give him a ride. And I, you know the term beeline? I noticed this waft and I don't know what the heck, it just start coming for his neck. And I literally stuck my arm out and slammed him into the car. And it, it, it stinger came off and my whole arm swole up. What a hero, what a hero, what a hero. What a hero. It was just like how you practiced with that bee. You're just like, I'm going to be the coolest mom ever. Yes, that's good. So um, a lot of us do have those experiences with, with wasps that they have stung us in the past. It's usually not a pleasant experience when you've had it. And especially when it's really, really hot, it seems like they are angrier when it is hot. I'm going to talk about uh, wasp anger in just a little bit. but. The point is, oh, before I do, David and I were talking earlier about a pain index when it comes to critters. And some of them, like our lovely fire ant right there, a show of hands, anybody ever been stung by a fire ant? Okay, one, two, three, good. A level one, well, just this week. Yeah, level one. And Dr. Schmidt says, light, ephemeral, almost fruity. A tiny spark has singed a single hair on your arm. It almost sounds romantic. So, you know, just put your hand in a fire ant bed for that experience. Um, whoops. Um, level two. Anybody ever been stung by a honeybee by, before? Good. A few people have. And what's interesting about those, you probably already know this, but because their stinger, their modified ovipositor is attached to all of their innards, when they sting you, that sting stays in. And that stinger is actually barbed, so it actually goes back a little bit too. So that's the point. Um, Dr. Schmidt says the oven mitt has a hole in it. When you pull the cookies out of the oven, again, it almost sounds like rewarding. There's a reward to getting this sort of thing. Let's jump up on the pain index here. We have our yellow paper wasp, polistes. A lot of these polistes have similar toxins in there. He says, bold and unrelenting. Someone is using a power drill to excavate your ingrown toenail. We're dealing with a little more pain here, not quite as romantic or rewarding as the previous two. And even here's the money right there. A hawk wasp, these spider wasps, blinding, fierce, shockingly electric. A running hair dryer has just been dropped into your bubble bath intense. The point is wasps are, occupy a lot of these higher levels on this pain index. 
People hate wasps. People hate wasps. Aristotle, this guy, he, he was made of stone, I guess. All the pictures that I see are stone of him. Aristotle, the father of biology, says hornets and wasps are devoid of the extraordinary features which characterize the bees. This we should expect, for they have nothing divine about them as the bees have been stung. He has been stung before <laughs> by wasps, and they're able to get through that stone. And there is actually, I don't want to say legitimacy, but it's not just anecdotal that people hate wasps. A really interesting study published a few years ago, actually, looked at, uh, I think they, they looked at 750 folks from 49 different countries globally and found out that people hate wasps. That's what they found out. People hate wasps. People love bees. Bees and wasps both sting. They both sting. Anybody been stung by a bumblebee before? Sure. It, it hurts. That thing hurts. But we love bumblebees. We love, there's a so, so fuzzy, so fuzzy, so fuzzy. We love bees, but hate wasps. Here's one of the um, consensuses that they found, or consensus that they found from this paper. The most popular words that participants used to describe bees included honey, flowers, pollen, and pollination. While the most popular words for wasp include sting, annoying, dangerous, angry, according to this study. They also found out that a lot more people are doing research on bees than are doing research on wasps. Here's the point of all of that. People know more about bees than they know more about wasps. So they know more about bees than they know about wasps. And with that unknown comes fear. So let's change some of that today. We're gonna change some of that today. And I'm gonna leave you with a few challenges for this uh, week too. I was uh, asked to do a presentation to a group in um, Burleson, a garden club. And they said, Sam, would you do a presentation on good bugs or bad bugs? Good bugs versus bad bugs. Little do they know yet, it's gonna be all good bugs <laughs> that I talk to them. So good luck with that. You know, people want butterflies, but not caterpillars. You know, they want butterflies, but not caterpillars. They want all of these beautiful things, but some of that other stuff, the icky bugs, they don't want them as much. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with some of this, but I don't know, excuse me, with some of, I'm sorry, with some of y'all, anybody grow tomatoes in here? Anybody grow tomatoes? Anybody ever seen one? Catherine, what do you do when you see one? <laughs> Good. I let them live. Good. Very good. And I go hungry. Um, you leave one on your plant and you know, a day, a couple days, that thing is defoliated. Did you know that that sphinx moth turns into a hummingbird moth? This is the adult. Beautiful. Amazing. These guys are fantastic. If you have any lantana in your landscape, you can actually sneak up on them and listen to the wing beat of these guys. They're so focused on pollinators. So I would argue a good bug here, but in reality, pretty good bug here too. So that garden club is in for a treat. Um, insects in the ecosystem, hopefully you know, they're the foundation. They are the foundation for the ecosystem. All of the things, even the things that may sting, that look angry all the time, they are still foundations of the ecosystem. They're eaten by stuff. They eat stuff. Just foundational. Wasps are beneficial to us. I know we like to view everything kind of homocentric. You know, we are the center of the universe and it's all about us. So uh, that's the way that we view things. That's what our species does. They're beneficial to us. If you have caterpillars in your landscape, wasps are going to be going after those caterpillars. That's one of their favorite, many of their favorite meals. The, I mean, that's like a filet mignon right there. I mean, look at all that goodness that it has. Um, Catherine, have you ever seen this on those guys? It is, and it's nightmare fuel. It's nightmare fuel. What's happening here is this is the late end of their cycle. 
But all of these little caterpillars, before they form this uh, little uh, cocoon right here, this pupil stage, they are eating the innards of that caterpillar while it is still alive. So just imagine that feeling. It's like, boy, my stomach kind of hurts. <laughs> well, you've got wasps that are eating your stomach out. So we call that a parasitoid. So it kills its host as opposed to a parasite, which wants you alive. Uh, we'll talk about some great examples of parasitoids in a second. These are wasps. This is a wasp that is predating or parasitizing a parasitoid of that sphinx. Have you ever seen, show of hands, anybody have ever seen this? If you have aphids on your plant, I want you to look closer. Look closer at those aphids. If you don't know what aphids are, they're the little itty bitty tiny bugs that suck up the juices of plants. Look closer. I want you to look to see if you can see any that look like this. We call these mummies. This is a mummy here. In reality, that aphid was a host for a little wasp that's about to pop out right there. Pretty dang cool. Pretty cool these wasps are. Again, nightmare material. It is nightmare material where it's like, hey, Frank's looking a little gray today. Well, yeah, about to be a young wasp. So they are, are beneficial to us. You may have heard of a little beetle, a lovely little beetle, it's actually very pretty. Uh, it goes by three letters, actually, E-A-B, emerald ash borer. Have you heard about this? You know about this? There are actually wasps, are native wasps that use emerald ash borers. This is the name of one over here, uh, Circesis, C-E-R-C-E-R-C-I-S, Circesis. Say what? Smoky Wing Bandit. Bandit. I like that better. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it loves that name. Sweet. Got a cool name. Um, it goes after these emerald ash borers, brings them down, it, it stings them, it, it basically paralyzes them, brings them down to the ground, lays an egg, and utilizes those. Other ones, like this little braconid over here, will parasitize the larva of our emerald ash borers. I bring this up to say that wasps are utilizing whatever resource is available. They are utilizing whatever resource is available. In this case, it's a novel resource, a new resource here that they are utilizing. Have you ever seen a wasp getting eaten and smiled a little bit? Hmm. They are food. They are food for things. And I don't know if you were like me as a little kid, or maybe recently, sometimes you'd throw a little grasshopper into a spider web, you know, just sacrifice it for my enjoyment. Um, they eat wasps. They eat wasps. And I know there's so many critters that are waiting for me in the afterlife. All of those grasshoppers are. I recognize that. But they eat wasps. And you go, well, how does a spider eat a wasp? And the spider really has the patience to do that. If you haven't seen these, um, uh, oh gosh, Argiope. Can you remember the common name of these guys? Uh, zipper spiders or garden spiders, yellow garden spiders. Some people call them banana spiders. I don't think they care what we call them. Uh, but this guy, it wraps up a, a prey item, even a stinging prey item, injects a little toxin in there and sort of holds back, waits until that toxin does its work. And then it can feed, slurp up that, um, that potential prey. I mentioned how um, wasps eat caterpillars. They love eating caterpillars. Aha, nature has a little vengeance in it right here. This is a moth species. Did you know that there is a caterpillar that eats baby wasps? We have it here in Dallas-Fort Worth too. This is one of the ones that we have in DFW. These little wasps, or these little moths right here called the sooty wing Chalciola, maybe. Um, that's the genus for these. They hang out at Polistes' nest, at the paper nest, lay eggs inside of there, and the little caterpillars eat the developing wasps. If you have some wasp nest and you're able to look at, at night, go at night, and sometimes you'll see these little moths hanging out close to a wasp nest. So nature has a bit of vengeance right there. I don't know if you can really see it here. But there's, there's our lovely paper wasp, and there's the little caterpillar right there of this. Way cool. Yay. Totally way cool. So wasps are beneficial to us for our garden pest. 
wasp are beneficial to the ecosystem as keeping things in check, but also as food. Did you know that wasps are also pollinators? They are pollinators, especially the fuzzy ones. Those hairs probably are intentionally used or initially used to keep maybe little parasites out or other things, but plants have modified the way that they move around. If it's a fuzzy creature, creature coming to that flower, some pollen is going to get stuck to the hairs. So wasps, some wasps are pollinators too. So they are, are useful for that. And nature does some way cool stuff with this. If you look like something that may sting you, you typically want to avoid that. You want to avoid that thing. So nature, natural selection, has chosen things that look like wasps. If I look like a wasp, I'm likely to survive and pass on those genes for a little bit longer. So we have our one wasp right here, and the rest are mimics. So these are all mimics. Let's look at a few of these together. The clear wing moths. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I posted this on DFW uh, Facebook page, the Texas Parks and Wildlife DFW page. What do you think I got? Do you think I got, oh, it's beautiful. What do you think? The fire. Fire was the big word that people used. Fire, fire, fire. Let's burn that thing. The mimicry is great that even we or some people don't like it because it looks like something that we don't like. This is great defense, though. What a great defense to look like something that could potentially sting you. This could keep you alive. Here's one of my observations of this. We have these clear wing moths. This was observed in Dallas. A lady that posted this outside her uh, car window. She probably rolled up the window really fast and uh, took a picture of it. So very cool. Flies. If you're hungry, is it worth it? Is it worth it to get a sting on your little mouth if you're a critter? In this case, nature is hoping that it's not worth it. And it's keeping this quite harmless critter, this harmless fly, safe using the patterns of a wasp with the blacks and the yellows. Harmless fly uh, called the eastern hornet fly. We have those two. Love these things. Uh, has anybody ever seen one before? A mantid fly. Very good. A few people have. Crazy cool. This is a crazy cool critter. This is not even closely related to mantises, to praying mantises. Totally different lineage here. And actually, its arms actually go backwards like that when it's grabbing food. These guys found here in DFW, this is a wasp mimicking mantid fly. Quite harmless, quite harmless. It is a predator, so it will grab little tiny stuff there too. But nature is selecting for stuff that looks like a wasp. So real quick, let's, uh, you know, go through the bushes a little bit. Um, what is a wasp? What is this group of wasps? The truth is, and I don't want to bore you here, um, it's paraphyletic. In other words, we have things in the wasp family that aren't really wasps. So the bees and the ants are in this same insect order, Hymenoptera. So the order here, Hymenoptera. Actually, let's do that together. On the count of three, we're going to say that word together, just so that we know what it sounds like. Okay, so the word is Hymenoptera. All right, ready? One, two, three. Hymenoptera. Good. Hymenoptera is the insect order of wasps. It also includes bees and ants. There's a little bit of discussion on exactly what the hymen means in Hymenoptera. There's the wings, the two pairs of wings are fused, at least at some point of their life. So maybe it's for the Greek god of, of unions, hymen. Um, it could also be that's the old word for membrane. So we don't quite know exactly, or at least I don't know exactly why they have this name, but they do, and that's what they go by. Uh, Gabriel and Lola, would you all help me with something real quick? Good. All right, come on up here. Okay, so I have some show and tell. And Gabriel and Lola are going to help me out with something. So I've got a handful of wasps. Okay. And they're dead, so don't worry. Okay, so Gabriel, would you do me a big favor? Yes. Would you take these, and I want you to go around, and each row gets like two. Okay? And Lola, would you do that? And they're dead, I promise you. They're dead. They've been frozen for like a month. 
Good. Very good. Thank you so much. And then each row gets like two of those. Good. Okay. So let's look at, you're doing good. Lola. Very good. Thank you, Gabriel. So take some of these guys and pass them around. You can hold on to them for a little while. Let's look at some of these wasps together. So Lola, you're doing so good, my friend. Okay. So um, take these guys, let's pass them around, maybe look at them a little bit. Let's look at the structures on our wasp. Did you get enough, uh, Gage? I think I have two more if you want a couple more here, bud. Got it? Okay. So um, these are some paper wasps. Do you have a few more, buddy? Yeah, here you go. Thank you. You guys are so brave. Thank you. Um, so they were in a bird nest. So what I did is I just plugged the hole and I put it in the freezer. So they go to sleep. I think they just go to sleep, right? So let's look at a couple of these structures on our wasp. And if you want, so each row has a couple, so you can pass it around so you can take a look at those. They have the standard body system of an insect. They have the three segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. On the thorax, that's where all the appendages are. So the wings, the legs, those are all on the thorax. Oops, one more time, Mike, I think. There we go, all right. Um, okay, so you may also notice a little stinger on there. You may have to fiddle with the abdomen a little bit. They're dead. They should be dead by now. So uh, you may have to fiddle with that, that abdomen. They've been frozen for like a month. So I hope they're dead. Cool. Thank you, buddy. Awesome. Um, so they have this modified ovipositor. For some of our wasps, actually for the majority of our wasps, they don't sting. They don't sting. So this ovipositor is just that. It's an egg layer inner. That's what the ovipositor is. Some of them have that modified ovipositor as a barb that injects some venom. Here's what I want you to look for, especially if you still have a wasp. Look at that face up close. And if you're able to, and sometimes you may have to put it right up to your eyeball, they have a group of three little dots at the top. And these structures are called ocelli. And I always thought that ocelli were just light and dark, would tell it's light and dark. But I've heard some other things, especially when it comes to our flying insects like wasps, that ac they actually use this to level themselves for balance. And I don't know what the, the instrument is in a plane, but whatever it is, a, a horizontal stabilizer or something like that, it's the same sort of thing with those ocelli. So they're basically stabilizing themselves or viewing the, the world so that they're flying straight on there. Anybody able to see those ocelli? Good, all right, very good. So little tiny dots that are ocelli on these guys. So they do, oh good, now here's some excitement on, oh, I see them, I see them. Um, how many wasps are there? How many wasps are there? The answer, a lot, a whole lot of wasps we have. And if you want, you can take those wasps home, you know, if you want a, a little bit. Um, so there are a lot of wasps out there and we don't even really know how many wasps there are uh, that live on our planet. Sometimes people would say that Coleoptera, the beetles are the most speciose group on the planet. Other people argue that the Hymenoptera, the wasps are. And mostly that's because different species of wasp have different hosts. So you'll have different hosts for different species of, of wasps. So there are a lot of wasps. So let's go over some examples and let's talk about them. We'll start out with potter wasps. A show of hand, anybody ever see a potter wasp before? They're so cool. They are so amazingly cool. These potter wasps, they are predators. So they will be eating caterpillars, other little bugs for their babies. Yes, sir. We'll talk about mud daubers in a second. Yes. So similar in that they'll form a structure here that has their babies down in there with the paralyzed food. But these guys also feed on nectar. They feed on pollen. So they're getting that high 
uh, fructose, that high saccharose, that high octane uh, energy from those uh, flower structures. Definitely pollinators. And when you look at them close, a lot of them are fuzzy. Now let's talk about our mud gobbers, spider wasps. I, I love to do show of hands. Um, has anybody ever watched a wasp take a spider? Isn't it awesome? It is incredible. And sometimes, I don't know if you've seen it, what I've seen, um, but they'll get onto an obstacle and they'll just keep going at it. Keep trying to get over that little branch or up that wall. Pretty amazing. This is um, in this group, Pompilid. Uh, Pompilidae is the family for it. What it does is it finds a spider. It stings it. It stings it with a paralyzing agent, with a toxin. The spider is alive. It is alive. And nightmare material this is nightmare material it's probably watching this whole thing it's probably watching as this wasp drags it into its home has little compartments in here it will drag spiders over in here lay an egg and give some fresh food to that developing wasp pretty dang cool here's where we talk about mud daubers uh, who here has seen the most mud daubers in your garage okay we got one right there Guinness World Records. Everywhere. Everywhere. Um, that's okay. So without those mud daubers there, it would be loads and loads of spiders. Loads of spiders. So each one of their little compartments, each one of those little things is filled with spiders. And with those spiders is a little egg, a developing wasp that's using that fresh food of those spiders. You don't have to, and I know, um, I know that I'm a bad conservationist because I like to knock things down and look at them up close. But if you do have some mud dauber nest, one thing that you can do is break that open and you probably will see some little spiders in there. Some of those spiders are still alive too. So uh, pretty scary. You may have seen these guys, cicada killer is good. Uh, show of hands, has everybody seen a cicada killer? Yeah, these guys are out. They are out, they are abundant. Do cicada killers sting? You better believe they'll sting, <laughs> yeah. Now they don't typically sting, but if you're grabbing one, whoo, it lets you know, it lets you know. It uses a neurotoxin that knocks down these big old cicadas. It, paralyzes that thing, drags it over into its hole, lays an egg, and that little egg eats that fresh cicada. As a little kiddo, one of the things I did, I had a badminton racket, and my dad would pay me a quarter for each little uh, cicada killer that I whacked because they destroyed the lawn. Um, and now I love cicadas and cicada killers. So we talked about some of the ways that they utilize prey like spiders. Cuckoo wasps are crazy. If you know the term cuckoo, actually tell me a bird that's a cuckoo. Anybody know? Roadrunner, good. Yes, yellow belt, yes, yellow billed cuckoo. You better believe it. Cuckoos, what they do is they're um, nest parasites. So in some cases, they'll lay their eggs, not in all of ours, um, but some of them will lay their eggs in another nest for the other parents to take hold of them. These wasps do that. So these guys will go over to a mud dauber nest lay their little egg in there, and that developing cuckoo wasp eats not just the spiders, but those wasps. It eats those. And I kind of like that. Oh, hmm. kind of stinks. Uh, but man, are they pretty. Whoa, they're so pretty. So the next time you see one of these go, you're a hyperparasite, and I love you. Um, another example of this group, the emerald wasps. Really interesting, and a lot of science fiction is based on nature. I know it is. So this exact species, this emerald wasp, it's been found in Florida. We have our own native species of emerald wasp that's in this genus. What it does, and forgive me if you've already heard the story of these, what they do is they will see a cockroach, they'll fly over, they'll put a neurotoxin, they'll sting it, put a neurotoxin. That cockroach sort of tweaks out a little bit. The wasp flies back, grabs the antenna, and much like we would walk our dog, it walks it over to its nest. Let's see if we can watch it. Okay. 
Now, one thing that I want to bring your attention, that cockroach is walking. It's not being drugged. It is being led. It is being led into the home here. You can see it right there. Look at these legs. That's an intentional movement. That's intentional. So this neurotoxin has grabbed those ganglion in the brains of, of their laying its egg. It's laying its egg right in there. I know some of you had to look away. I saw <laughs> what happens. There's the egg of this, of this onto that, of this emerald wasp into the cockroach there. After it lays its egg, that cockroach stays put. It does not escape. It stays in there. So we'll really need, and there it flies off. It's like, bye, son. So pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Hawaii actually introduced a lot of these to control cockroach populations. That's a dangerous experiment. It's a dangerous experiment to play with that. Um, but we do have native of ones that do this same sort of thing. Incredible. And my friends, I am showing you just a few examples, five, six examples. There's a hundred thousand other examples of this kind of interaction of these. Velvet ants, you may know this, not a true ant, although, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, it is in Hymenoptera. It is in this plant, in this order of insects, but these are more wasps than they are ants, more closely related to our spider wasps than they are to our fire ants. So the velvet ant, we're looking at a female here and a male here. This female velvet ant, and if you've ever seen one, they're fast, super fast. They walk around looking for ground nests. They look for ground nests. These are parasitoids. So they're looking for a ground nest of either solitary wasps or some other critter that has a hole in the ground, walks over to it, goes down in that hole, lays an egg, goes and finds the next one. Those little eggs, much like a lot of these other wasps that I talked about, will eat that developing little critter. So these are parasitoids. The males, quite harmless, quite harmless, lovely little creatures. Uh, so think about that. The next time you see one, it's on the hunt for a ground nesting wasp. The last group that I'll talk about with the solitary wasps, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention, these are all solitary wasps. In other words, they don't form colonies. I'll talk about those in a second. The ichneumon are the braconids. These are our parasitoids. Thousands and thousands and thousands of species of these. Some of them have a specific host that they just feed on one type of lepidopter, one type of, um, one type of moth, one type of butterfly, one type of whatever it might be, beetle. Um, other cases, they're generalist. So our braconid over here is utilizing whatever big caterpillar that exists. And then we also have our gall forming wasps. So the things that sting the trees, they sting the trees, they inject that tree with a toxin to create a tumor. Basically a gall is a tumor, a tumor that develops over that toxin and egg of that too. Um, a good friend of mine, Kimberly Stassan, some of you may know Kimberly, she just discovered a new species of these at the Fort Botanic Gardens. So way cool, way cool. There's a lot of species of these and they're host specific typically too. So they'll be in this case on a red oak, one of the red oaks, either Quercus, uh, Schumards or Buckley's red oak there. Probably seen that too. Okay, now let's talk about our favorite ones. The ones that almost always just look angry. Doesn't it just look angry? You know, it just looks angry, but they're not, they're not uh, social wasps. And you may have people say, oh, a yellow jacket. You mean a yellow jacket? And it's kind of a Southern thing that we call these things yellow jackets, that anything black and yellow is a yellow jacket. The truth is that the critter doesn't care what we call them. They don't care what we call them. But yellow jacket is just a common name for things that are black and yellow and maybe sting. That's a yellow jacket. Uh, but there's a few different social wasps that we'll talk about. The ground hornets. Anybody stumbled on one of these before? You're weeding your garden or you're raking some leaves and there's a hole and you're even 
twinging a little bit. It just caused you to wiggle around just because of those feelings. The truth is underground, there is a nest, there is a colony of these critters that are utilizing resources, grabbing pollen, grabbing nectar, grabbing invertebrates, grabbing other things to feed to those developing babies. And then we have our lovely paper wasp, Polistes. Here in Dallas, Fort Worth, we probably have 10 different species of these guys. Our lovely one called the red wasp. We actually have a couple species of these, two different species. And you tell them apart by the hairs on their chin. So you got to get close pictures. You got to get some good pictures if you want to know which species of red wasp that is. Uh, if you know what to properly call it. But all of these guys found here in Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, they're really incredible once you sort of set aside some fear of them potentially stinging. So they do make these nests. And I do have um, an example of a nest that was in my little bird box. So it's very fascinating how they do this. And maybe you've seen it before. They're using wood chips. So they're grabbing wood chips basically like this little Vespula is right here, this little ground hornet, grabbing little wood chips, getting a little bit of the, oh, what's that, kindling, or kind of chiseling away some of that. They mix it with their saliva, and they create these pretty elegant structures. One part that's mind-blowing to me is the surface area of these. So they are hexagons, there are little hexagons in there. At the end, if you want to look at it, if you haven't seen a wasp nest before, perfect hexagons. And this is actually for the thermodynamics of a wasp nest, that all of them can lose the same amount of heat. Uh, and they're pretty crazy. The physics of a wasp nest is amazing in itself. How do wasps survive? How do wasps make new colonies? How does a, a one wasp nest become another wasp nest. It's kind of weird. Starting out in a circle, where do you start? Uh, let's start with just our queen. The queen overwinters, in our area at least, underneath stuff. And I don't know if you've ever been going through a, a brush pile or a wood pile. You flipped it over and there's a wasp underneath there that may be cold during the winter. That's a young queen or a queen, maybe not necessarily young, but a queen that is hibernating until the next generation. She will start that new nest with this, lay eggs. Some of these become males. Some of these become females. The males, gosh, how far do I want to go down this rabbit hole? Um, do it? Okay. So you, you know with sex chromosomes, the XY, you know XY chromosomes, males actually are unfertilized. So they're just X. There's no Y, there's just the X sex chromosome. With our females, be it a queen or a worker, that's an XX. One thing that's fascinating is when you take down a colony of wasps and a couple of them fly off, if they're females, if they're workers, they go through a physiological change to become a new queen. That's a little bit different than like our ants or our other social critters that it's a selected thing, a caste system based on that, um, the, the females there. But if it's a worker wasp, if you knock down that nest and you got the queen, well, if one flies away, if it's a female, she can become a new queen. Pretty dang cool um, with that. So are wasps always angry? And I'll, I'll read this out. So this is both far side. It was foolish for Russell to approach the hornet's nest in the first place but his timing was particularly bad. Angry hour, four to 5 p.m. Sorry, Russell. And this one says, the action suddenly stopped while both sides waited patiently for the hornet to calm down. You can see they're all waiting for that guy to calm down. So are wasps angry? And I like this terminology, aggressive versus defensive. I don't know if I've really interacted with anything that's aggressive in nature, honestly. I don't think I've ever uh, interacted with anything that's aggressive. If I get too close to something, I would argue it's defensive. It's trying to defend itself. It's not actively trying to hunt me down to try to sting that little kid that's getting into your car. You're probably not trying to do that sort of thing. You're too close to something. It's something that you're too close for. So it's not trying to kill me to eat me. It's more defending either its area or its health. 
I don't know. I guess it depends on who you talk to if wasps are angry or not. During the hottest time of day, they are ectotherm or bacillothermic. In other words, if it's hot outside, they're hot inside. So that's, they're ready to go. If, if it's you know hot outside, they are ready to go. They are warmed up, ready to go. If it's cold outside because they're bacillothermic, they're gonna be cold inside. It's gonna take a little bit longer for them to warm up. As I was doing the research for this, um, I actually had a long section on how to manage for wasps. And I left all that out. I left all of that out. There are industries that are based on managing wasps. True. Uh, sprays. You can definitely use a lot of sprays. People use sprays for them. You know, the sprays are impacting the trachea, the breathing tubes of these. The sprays are probably short half-life, so may not cause too much um, ecological damage by the use of these sprays. There are industries that are based on wasp removal. I would challenge you. I would challenge you. If you, were, if you can let them be, utilize that opportunity to observe them. Watch them. Maybe from a distance, but watch them. Watch them and be pretty amazed about these things. And it's true, you may want to do this from a little bit of a distance, from a couple steps away. But I've watched, and as I was planning for this, I actually challenged myself to sit down next to a Polistes nest, not that one that I killed, but another Polistes nest, a paper wasp nest. I sat down and I watched it for about 15 minutes. That's a long time. I mean, if you're taking, watching your clock, that's a long time to sit down and you know not have your phone right by you. But I just watched this Polistes nest amazing to see the interactions that they have with each other when they bring other stuff to it. Um, with this group, they were building another cell. So I saw them kind of work on that. There is my challenge for you. Try to do that. There are some great resources available for these online. If you've been on the internet before, you can find anything on the internet, but there are also some great sites for wasps, for studying wasps, for identifying wasps. One of them, Bug Guide, you probably have heard of this, and you even have icons over here. If you click on the wasp, it gives you this order and you can browse through them. I don't think I've done a presentation in the past seven years without mentioning iNaturalist. I'm bonkers about this most revolutionary tool I've ever touched in my life and my genetics. I mean, I used a DNA sequencer. This is a more powerful tool with a lot of bias. I'll say that uh, so far in Denton County in this order, insect order, 368 species of bees, wasps, and ants. How many can you name? I gave you six. So far, 300 more that are just waiting for you to see them. I know I'm throwing some emotion onto it, but I think they're just waiting for you to look at them, appreciate them, and maybe document them. There are some great wasp books. Um, one of my, oops, one of my favorite ones that I just got not too long ago is this one. This is done by an individual very active on iNaturalist. Uh, she used pictures from iNaturalist on um, this too. So it's so good. Highly, highly, highly suggest this book. So I'm not getting commission or anything like that. It's just a great book. It is a great book. And I don't know how many field guides you have. Maybe you have a bookshelf of field guides. Whenever I look at a field guide, it isn't necessarily to identify something. But what it really does is it trains my eyes. It trains my eyes to start to look for some of these differences or just to be more aware of the things that I'm looking at in the field guide. So with this field guide, it's so good. It gives you a lot of biology, all that kind of stuff. I can't talk more highly about this book. It's dang good. So that's a, a good one if you're into um, old school books. So there they are. So you thought this was going to be just fun and games, huh? Hmm? Okay. Um, would you raise up your hand and put out your pinky like this? Okay. Now curve that a little bit. You know what we're doing? This is a pinky promise. Okay. So we are pinky promising, and you can put your hands down now. We are pinky promising that sometime this week, you are going to go out and try to find five different types of wasps. 
Okay, five different types of wasps. That's our challenge. And I, you, I don't know if you're a student of history, there have been wars waged on broken pinky promises. So we pinky promised together that number one, we're going to go outside. That's, hey, if that's all you do as part of this challenge, good. That's fine. That still counts. Go outside. But I challenge you, try to find at least five different kinds of wasps. Okay, you don't have to turn this assignment in or anything like that, although you did promise me that you were going to do it. Uh, try to find five different types of wasps. If you're able to, you don't have to, but if you're able to take a photo either with your phone or with a camera, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Uh, so if you're able to take a photo, if you're able to or want to, you can toss this on a naturalist. And hey, if you want me to give you some kudos, if you tag me with your fifth species of wasp, I will drown you with respect, okay? <laughs> Uh, so Sam Biology is my username for the fifth kind of wasp. And how many? Maybe you can find 10 species of wasp, maybe 20, maybe 30. Hmm, who can find the most? So that is your challenge for the week. Um, I went a bit long, forgive me. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments about wasps? Uh, real quick, if you're scared to ask me in person, um, I asked the state for the longest possible email address and they gave it to me. So it is my name at tpwd.texas.gov. I'm probably, I check my iNaturalist more than my email. So Sam Biology on iNaturalist. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? So I'll repeat that just in case for the people online. So having a great time watching a cicada killer bringing stuff all over to its holes and around those holes there were velvet ants that were going in there either utilizing that cicada or utilizing the young wasp in there another crazy cool thing and i remember this was from a book that i used as a kid called young naturalist wasps that have holes use landscape features they use features here's a fun experiment to do if you want to tick off nature if you put, if you have a, a, a wasp, a, a ground nesting wasp, like a cicada killer, what you can do is put a series of stones around it. Okay, so put some stones around this, five, six stones, and let it get sort of used to that a day, a couple days. What you can do next is take those stones, move them to another spot that's nearby, and it's going to not find its hole. They are using the landscape features to find their holes. Is that not amazing? Way cool. Try that. Try that. Uh, so um, if it's an active hole, sometimes the holes aren't active or they've already you know, done their thing, but put some stones around it. Let it sit for a couple days. Move those stones, not too far away, but pretty close so you can laugh while they're going around, um, but move those stones and they'll fly to the center of that looking for their hole and they'll have trouble finding it again. Isn't that cool? Yes. Yeah, Michelle. That's very sweet of you. So I'll, I'll repeat that. Michelle did her good act for the day. Um, found a, a, a paralyzed, a living paralyzed that was staring at you the whole time as, as you took it and brought it back to its, its hole. But um, yeah, kind of interesting. And what's fascinating about this, look at the size. Um, you know, that's a big prey item. That's a beast. That's nearly the same size as this wasp. So when it goes for the kill here, the truth is, of course, that cicada can't do anything. It doesn't have a stinger. The mouth part, that, that rostrum, you know, is for injecting into plants. So it doesn't really have any sort of biting capability. That's still big. And you can actually hear this interaction take place. You might hear the cicada do that last little scream as, it, as it's paralyzed by, by that critter. Crazy, crazy cool stuff. Uh, yes, Jane. Great question. So I'll repeat that just in case. So Jane is asking, I like wasps. Okay, I like wasps. But they're there in the worst spot. They're in the worst spot. They're by my mailbox. They're by this birdhouse. They're right in front of my door. And I keep taking this down, but they keep finding that place back. Well, the truth is that's a good spot for them. That's what they have chosen. And uh, I won't lie, I've knocked down wasp nests before that are close to the mailbox or close to the door. Um, I do it with the realization that they're going to be back. 
They're going to be back there. I've heard that people do different things. Some people will paint the ceiling of their hanging over there blue, like a blue color, and that prevents some of those. I don't know. I think it's just the blue paint salesmen that say, say that. Um, but but I, I think what it is, is just nature has chosen that spot. Nature's chosen that spot. So it's a lot of persistence on our place to sort of keep them out of that. I wish I had a good answer for you. How could you do that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you're allowed to let them be recognize that, you know, they can be defensive when we get too close, but the vast majority of the time, it's a peaceful coexistence. Jan. A good question. So uh, Jan is asking about antlions. So antlions, they're not wasps. They're in a different insect order, the neuroptera or the nerve wings. So um, they look a little bit like wasps when they're adults, but in a different order, a different group. Good question. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, you know, and I've heard some things about the different smelling stuff that mints, actually, the mint plants or mint fragrances are somewhat of a deterrent to wasps. I don't know how much truth there is to that, uh, but it is that same sort of persistence of, yes, ma'am, please. Pepper oil, okay. Peppermint, okay. Interesting. Yeah, so something something I didn't mention in the book actually talks about it. I didn't know how long. I mean, I could give a three-hour class. We could talk about wasps for days on end and still find out new stuff. Um, they do communicate through pheromones. There's a great, one of my favorite books is called For Love of Insects. Love that book. Um, written by Thomas Eisner, a chemical ecologist. And he talks about the hidden communication that insects and other things have, that they smell, they in interpret, experience the world differently. So these guys use pheromones. That's the antenna. They're filled with chemoreceptors to sense whatever it may be, a potential prey item or a potential mate or their home, all that sort of stuff. So it makes sense if you're able to overpower that with a mint or some strong fragrance, perhaps that's another way that you can try to manage these, these wasps. Uh, time maybe for one last question. Anybody have one last question? Linda, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So again, I'll repeat that just in case. Um, so more evidence of that strong, fragrant, minty smell. If you're able to take wherever their nest is, if you're able to knock it down, great. If not, maybe just the spray on that or wipe that on that on cool morning, cooler periods of time. That's when you need to do it. Just move on. I don't mind you, but go there. Yes, right. Good question. Yes, Abigail. Good. Yeah, so Abigail's using some wasp spray instead of deodorant. That's good. So, that's, yeah. So, yeah, some of these wasp smells, it's a good smell. It's a good smell, but it's a strong, a very fragrant smell. And there probably are some organic companies that do that sort of, um, you know, essential oils kind of stuff too. Again, my big challenge, and I'll leave it with that challenge slide, if you're able to coexist, and I know it can be hard, and maybe your neighbors can't coexist with, with the stuff on your house, but take those little opportunities to utilize that educational uh, opportunity that nature is tossing at you. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing. If you do have to spray them or kill them, toss them in the freezer, utilize that opportunity too. And I saw some people doing it with their phones, with the magnifying feature on their phones. Look at these structures up close. Study that little creature that you had to remove because it wasn't in the right spot. Take that as a little educational item that, that nature has thrown your way and you can get some, some fun pleasure. One last one. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So thank you for mentioning that. So this book actually talks about uh, human uses and it has a ch chapter on the medicine and the toxins that wasps use can kill cells. They can be ne necrotic. In other words, if you have a tumor that's developing, you can inject this with some, not you. I mean, don't you just <laughs> find a wasp and just put it in there and go, Ugh! Um, but you know, doctors, the medical community is utilizing some of these nature's toxins that are necrotic killing cell things they're using those for for tumors and for cancers and all kind of issues thank you so much you know a master of master naturalist is not expert 
Master does not mean expert with master naturalist. Just need to tell you that. It does not mean that you have to have all the answers. I think what the master of master naturalist means is dedicated to learning, dedicated to caring about these things. That's what the master of master naturalist is. So I encourage you, uh, take a look at wasps. They're pretty magnificent and tell your neighbors about their magnificence too. Uh, with that, thank you so much for letting me come and talk to y'all this morning. Keep up the good work um, and thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Hey, isn't there something you left out? Something that I, yeah, that I left out a lot. Something about, something about a bio blitz coming oh, up? Would you like me to talk about that? Sure. So the first full week in September, um, gosh, I was joking around with some, some folks. So I was wearing my mask for a lot of this a couple weeks ago. I got COVID I'm testing negative now, just to let you know, testing negative, but I still got this cough that's popping up every now and then I'm vaxxed. I'm boosted. I felt so confident that I have beaten COVID that it won't find me. Well, it did. It did find me. So there are folks that want to be cautious right now with where they interact with, where they go, just the volunteer activities that they do. So because of that, three years ago, when COVID just started, we had a socially distant bio blitz. In other words, a week long of making observations, tossing them on iNaturalist and contributing to the scientific community, but also guiding management and all that sort of stuff. So the first week in September, September 4th through 10th, there is the socially distant bio blitz, our third year socially distant bio blitz. The six chapters of Master Naturalist in the DFW of uh, Metroplex are, I don't want to say competing, are participating in this. That each chapter has certain counties that they serve. The Elm Fork is Denton and Cook and Wise. Okay, so those three counties you have as your territory. All of the observations made in those three counties from September 4th through September 10th get added to this project automatically. You don't have to do anything else. If you're within those counties, they count. If you say, oh, but I got to go to Dallas for something, you can still make observations in Dallas. They still count, but that goes to the North Texas groups. I know, ooh, harumph, 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 harumph. Um, so it still counts, still counts. Um, observations made anywhere will count for this. If you're able to, the observations made in public spaces, a park, those are the most valuable. Those are the ones that I use when I'm talking to city council, to park board, to the folks that manage that park and say, look, not only is there biodiversity, but there's a constituency of people that come to this park to look at bugs manage for these folks just as you manage for the critters so if you're able to go to a public place cool each one of those four days or seven days there's going to be a daily challenge as well Ooh, a daily challenge can i give you a hint on what one of the challenges is one of the wasp oh that's good <laughs> maybe the the thing the the challenge of one i got some good ones but one of them is observe a thief in nature what is that what is a thief in nature can you make an observation of a thief hmm. and you may have to think about it a little bit and you could go well this was a thief of my joy or something like that okay if you want to like observe a fire ant a thief of my uh, pleasure, but uh, there's going to be seven daily challenges each day. There's a daily challenge. Do you want to know what the challenges are? If you go to inaturalist.org, there's a journal post on it, but I'll also send it in an email uh, so that you can send that, that out too. So that's the first week in September. Good. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Wasn't this fantastic? So you'll hear, be hearing more about the bio blitz um, that Sam was just talking about, especially project leaders. I want y'all to sign up for a couple of mini bio blitzes during the big bio blitz. And then there's also the pollinator bio blitz that's gonna be in October. So I'll be sending out emails. Stay tuned. All right, thanks everybody.
Okay, so terrific meeting. Glad everybody made it out. Uh, next month, at back at the elections building, which is something we were, haven't been to in a while. So I think most people know where that is. And let's see, uh, 45 minutes for business and an hour for a tea. Great, thank y'all for coming. <laughs>